Where's the forest? Well, it's dark out, and my love of explaining complex forestry topics to absolutely no one knows no bounds. So here we are. This is a little piece of carbon. And if we were to take one ton of this and lock it up in a warehouse for 100 years to offset the fact that I've mined a buttload of Bitcoin, then 100 years from now, presumably, I could go into that warehouse and there'd be all that carbon still remaining. Also, I would be filthy rich because of my Bitcoin. However, the carbon that I put into the atmosphere in my Bitcoin mining, it won't still be in the atmosphere. It won't still be causing the Earth to get warmer. And so this is the idea behind 10-year accounting. The fact that putting carbon in a warehouse for 100 years is not the same as putting carbon in the atmosphere for 100 years. In fact, putting carbon in a warehouse for 100 years, it's, you know, it's a little overdoing it because realistically, after a 100-year period, only about 40 to 45% of the carbon that you put into the atmosphere is still going to be there. The rest of it goes into the oceans, some of it goes into geological processes, some of it goes uh, back into the biota. To be clear, most of it does go in the oceans, and we'll talk about problems with that in a bit. So this is, this is the fundamental idea. And so we can take advantage of the decay rate in carbon in the atmosphere uh, to kind of level the playing curve. Because one ton of CO2 is actually doing more to prevent climate change than preventing one ton of CO2 from going into the atmosphere, we can kind of take advantage of this decay rate issue fewer credits and still have a an impact 100 years from now that is equal to whatever you put into the atmosphere. So really the only way to understand what's going on here is to look at it in the series of graphs. Uh, so let's, let's go ahead and do that. What I've plotted out here is our first scenario. And so let's examine this graph. On the y-axis here uh, is the amount of carbon. So let's assume it's just one ton. Uh, and the amount of carbon well, you know, depending on our scenario, so in the first scenario, it's the amount of carbon in the warehouse. In the next scenario, it'll be the amount of carbon in the atmosphere. And then on the x-axis, we have years. And most of the time, people are measuring this stuff uh, in terms of 100 years. So this is our first scenario. This is our warehouse scenario. And essentially what's happening here is we're just locking a ton of carbon up for 100 years. And so that for that whole time, that whole ton of carbon is going to be locked up. Uh, in that warehouse. Now, this is how a lot of carbon credits work today. So California Air Resource Board credits, most vast majority of the Climate Action Reserve credits, they all work this way. But you may notice that other project types, uh, like VERA projects and American Carbon Registry projects, you know, they're only 30 to 40 years long. And so this is actually what is happening with uh, VERA credits, for example. It's essentially locking those credits up in the forest, of course, not a warehouse, but and you know keeping them keeping them secure for a fixed duration for 40 years. So let's compare how this actually compares to what happens in real life when you put a ton of carbon into the atmosphere. When you put a ton of carbon into the atmosphere, it starts to decay right away. What it, it doesn't actually decay. Most of it, like I said, is absorbed by the ocean. But you know the point is, by the time that you've gotten out to 100 years, only about 40 percent of that carbon is is left in in the atmosphere and so the warming impact of that ton of co2 is not the same 75 or 100 years down the line as it was you know in in year one uh and so what is what does this mean this means that there is this difference between the credits that you can buy from carb in terms of global warming impact and the the amount of co2 that you're putting into the atmosphere Really, it means that when you buy a, a California Air Resource Board credit, um, you're kind of, in a sense, overdoing it because you're locking up that carbon for that entire 100-year period. Um, and that's that's actually more, you know, that's that's doing more to protect the Earth than you've done to damage the Earth by putting, that, putting a ton into the atmosphere. And so this is the difference that we can start to examine uh, and, and, and kind of figure out if, if there's a way that we can, uh, you know, take advantage of this, of this decay, of this difference, to issue credits that are kind of closer to what's actually being polluted into the atmosphere. So what we really want to consider, though, beyond this is, is what happens when we actually preserve a plot of land for some period of time and, and prevent it from being cut down uh, and essentially delay some sort of catastrophic harvest and, and keep those carbon credits locked up. And so this is what the ton-year credit system is all about. It's about saying, okay, maybe we don't want to lock these carbon credits up for 100 years. Maybe we'll lock them up for 10, 20, 30 years. 
or even one year. <laughs> and that's going to have an impact on the, the climate benefits 100 years from now. And so, you know, maybe those trees will be cut down 10 years from now, but having delayed that, that, that from happening, uh, it's having a tangible impact on global warming, you know, from now all the way up until 100 years. It's not as tangible, of course, as preserving the trees the entire time, but you can calculate that it is tangible. And so let's take a look at what that actually means. These, this is the difference here between delaying harvest and, and then letting that carbon go into the atmosphere and letting them harvest the trees. And, this, and, and then the red line, of course, is, is what actually happens if you were to let them harvest the trees immediately, or of course, if you were to put CO2 into the atmosphere. And so you can see that there is this tangible benefit that comes from delaying a forest harvest. You know, a project may only be even a year long, as long as you're genuinely just proving that you're actually delaying a harvest that would have taken place, you're having some sort of tangible benefit on, in the atmosphere into 100 years. And so it's, it's actually the area between these two curves that you're actually able to issue credits for, because this is the difference between what you cause to happen by preserving those trees for some period of time and what you're doing by polluting, you know, putting into the atmosphere, or what would have happened if those trees were cut down immediately. And so this is the basis for the 10-year approach. And as you can imagine, if, if we're talking about very short duration projects, you don't get too many credits to play with. The differences between the, the green curve and the red curve here would be pretty small. But there is still a difference. And if you're willing to issue that few credits, that small amount, which may only amount to a 30th or a 40th or a 50th of the, the total carbon, uh, if, you're still, if you're willing to take that hit, then you know I, the mathematical case can definitely be made that you're having an impact 100 years from now. And so this is used to justify shorter duration projects. Uh, the reason for this is that nobody wants to lock up their, their trees for 100 years. Nobody wants to sign that contract uh, giving away their great-great-grandchildren's right to harvest trees after the apocalypse. So, you know, the result here is that, you know, the types of people who are signing those contracts are people who are never going to cut those trees in the first place, like the Nature Conservancy, and the projects are not very good. So what's the solution been in the industry so far? Vera and the American Carbon Registry just shortened the length of their projects, right? So instead of having a 100-year project for a 100-year uh, ton of, of offsets, they just have a 30- or a 40-year project, or, or even a 20-year project sometimes. But some people do do the math. And by doing the math, you can basically compute by, by saying, all right, we keep this ton of carbon out of the atmosphere for five years. In reality, maybe that has the 100-year impact of keeping... I don't know, maybe a fifth of a ton of credit carbon out of the atmosphere for 100 years. And so that's that's the, the rationale behind uh, the 10 year accounting approach. It's a totally valid approach. I mean, there's, there's scientifically, there's no reason not to use it. On, on a per year basis, if you delay harvest for a single year, the ratio, I think, is around 40 to 50. So really, if you, if you have 50 tons of carbon that you're preventing from going in the atmosphere for only one year, you're only allowed to issue one ton under the 10-year approach. And again, this is a perfectly valid approach on paper. There's no reason that this doesn't work. Now, I do want to mention that, you know, the kind of fundamental assumption of this is, is that, like, uh, maybe the carbon's going into the ocean. Uh, I guess what I get tripped up on here is that and I don't, I don't know if I'm thinking about this the right way, but it seems as if this system works on the assumption that because these, this carbon is not going to stay in the atmosphere, it's kind of okay, right? So we can kind of assume that the carbon that is being removed from the atmosphere and put into the oceans, it's not having an impact on the climate, and therefore we can take advantage of that in our credit issuance. Um, and, you know, the thing is... Carbon going into the ocean absolutely has an impact. And the biggest impact is ocean acidification. So when CO2 is taken up by the ocean, uh, it doesn't stay CO2, it turns into carbonic acid. It's just a natural chemical reaction that takes place. And so what we're basically doing is we're making our oceans more acidic by putting CO2 into them. Uh, and this has pretty catastrophic consequences, mostly for organisms that use, uh, that create shells out of calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate is worn away by acid very easily. Uh, and so there's a real concern that every organism that uses shells, you know, that makes shells, may be at risk and, and may not even be able to survive long term 
in an ocean that's more acidic. And so what, what does this include? This includes obviously shellfish, you know, mussels and scallops and whatnot. It includes things like corals. So the, the, the basic building blocks of corals are, are, you know, calcium carbonate barnacles. It includes even little tiny floating plankton called diatoms, which again, make tiny little shells that are microscopic. And the thing is, of course, diatoms and, and others, they're, they're crucial elements to the, the, the ocean ecosystem. You know, what's going to happen if these guys can't make their shells? You know, worst case scenario, we may be talking about ecosystem collapse. And of course, that affects humans too, because a huge amount of human food comes from the oceans right now. So, you know, this is my vague concern and and feel free to make a comment and, and and point out if i'm not thinking about this the right way but it's definitely better for this carbon to be locked up in a warehouse or in trees for those hundred years than it is for it to go into the ocean i think maybe by looking at these curves of of the atmosphere we may be leaving out a crucial portion of the equation that really is is just as important <laughs> All right, so the ton year accounting, you know, it, it works out on paper. I have no problem with it at all. It's a great way to shorten the duration of your project. And, you know, it's got the Elias stamp of approval, okay? But the thing is, apart from the ton year accounting, and this is a different part of the video now, apart from ton year accounting, if you shorten the duration of your project, additionality becomes more and more difficult to prove. So what I mean by that is how do you actually demonstrate that that landowner was not going to harvest trees for that year? Take, for example, the you know timber companies. This is 2022. There are labor shortages all over the place. Timber companies can't hire enough people to actually cut down all their trees. So they're not able to harvest all the trees that they want to in 2022 right now. So, you know, that's that's kind of my warning. This is the kind of the due diligence and the math that I'd like to see before I, you know, necessarily buy credits that are only one year in duration. But in terms of 10-year accounting, there's no reason it can't happen. There's, there's no reason biologically and mathematically speaking that 10-year accounting can't work. It just makes the additionality a little bit more suspicious. So to summarize, 10 year accounting, uh, we're issuing fewer credits, delaying harvest by only one year, five years, 30 years, instead of a hundred years. But because we're issuing fewer credits, because we're taking advantage of this, this fact that CO2 decays over time once you put it into the atmosphere, then the math actually kind of works out. However, shorter duration projects, ha you have to be more suspicious about their additionality. It's much easier to prove that you would have harvested your trees over a 10 year period. It's it's hard to sit on trees that are really big, ready for harvest for 10 years. It's easy to sit on them for one year by accident. So uh, that's my explanation of 10 year uh, uh, accounting. And I, uh, I, I hope that it gets picked up by some of these other registries that are not enrolling their projects for 100 years.